A little bit more on the plate this year. Eight sacks, 10 quarterback hits, 31 more hurries, 18.6% pass rush win rate. Um, can you hear Gracie? Yes. Sorry. I'll, I'll do a pickup. Let me go calm her down. All right. All right. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Gracie. A few moments later. All right. Sorry about that. I can do a pickup. Oh, your, your mic is super sensitive now. Hello. 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 Yeah, it's super it's super loud. Is it? Yeah. Okay, hold on one sec. A few moments later. Is this better? No. That's so weird. This isn't better? Oh no, that is. I That's less. So much. Is this okay? Yeah, I think so. Check one, two, three, four. Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That should be fine. All right, three, two, one. Welcome to the opening bell of the NFL Stock Exchange podcast. I'm Trevor Sycamore. That is Connor Rogers. Join you guys on a midweek edition of the of the podcast, which means it's time for more positional rankings. Last week, we did wide receiver. Y'all were phenomenal with all the responses and engagement with the show. We absolutely loved it. We got to hear your thoughts on our thoughts. We got to see your wide receiver rankings. It was an absolute blast. So we are moving on with another premium position. Today, we're talking edge rushers. So Connor and I are going to give you our top 10 edge rushers as it stands right now after the regular season. It's really given us a chance to look at some of this regular season film, get some updates on these guys from a little bit, you know, we go through summer scouting, so we've got a good understanding of these guys. But during the season, we're trying to watch so many guys live and we don't really get to deep dive. Now, end of the season, regular season films in the book. We actually do. So I'm excited to hear, Connor, what your updated edge rush rankings are. Because like we've said before, although we are friends, we don't hate each other. I'm going to preface that by saying that we don't really text each other about it because we want to hear it on the show. So I'm genuinely excited to hear what your edge rush rankings are going to be. What you're telling people is we sacrifice our friendship for the sake of content. We kind of do. That honestly. is, we kind of do. Absolutely factual uh, during weeks like this. Listen, Edge rush is so edge rusher is always one of my favorite groups. I know you really like evaluating this position group. Um, we obviously set a really big baseline during summer scouting. I would say this is a funny thing to say at the top of the show, but I would say the mid grading point, mid ranking point, which is what we're doing today before final mm-hmm. rankings, which will be post combine. This is the one to me, not in the front end, like the top dudes are the top dudes, but on the back end that I find changes the most because I don't think I put more weight into any other position more than edge when it comes to the athletic testing. And I'm not saying a guy's a combine warrior and he goes from player 200 to 55, but this is a position that if you go through the history of it time and time again, more often than not, the guys that have success are really, really good athletes with the right kind of build and the right kind of trajectory. I think back to last year, if I was doing a show this time last year, Yaya Diaby wasn't a guy that was top of mind for me. And by the end of the process, with his testing, a recheck of his film, seeing how he wasn't used the right way, in my opinion, in college, Mm -hmm. I ended up being really, really high on him. So that's a really fun thing to keep in mind here. But this is a Bay Buccaneer legend. Yeah, He he looks pretty good, doesn't he? I know he does. Yeah, I thought so. He needs to be playing more. Yeah. No question. I think he looks good. So this is a show that the evolution of these rankings will be really fun to track over the next three to four months. Yeah, so uh, full transparency, as you would say, hand up. I did not get to as many of these guys as I wanted to this week. Um, I only got to... 12 or 13 of these guys. And that's because when it comes, when, when the final regular season film comes out, yeah, we still got like bowl season. So that film could matter a little bit, but I am genuinely trying to watch at least four or five games of all of these players. And yeah. some of it will come from the previous year. Cause I like to remind myself of kind of the background of where they're coming from and how they got better. But it's a lot more time consuming to do post regular season film. So this is a position, like you said, Hopefully this episode is a really good baseline for you guys. I watched a lot of the notable players that you kind of heard about. And so you get to hear our breakdowns and our rankings after their regular seasons here have finished. So it's more of that. This isn't the episode where we're going to give you the gems of the edge rush class yet. Like these sleepers, these day three guys. Exactly. That, That will come in a future episode. But with this position being 
such a premium, one that could be drafted as high as we've seen before, number one overall. Not that I think we have a guy in this class, but when you're good at edge, the NFL is going to find you and covet you. You got to get after the passer. So there's a lot of guys that are very intriguing. And I love that you brought up the athletic uh, aspect of this. And as this episode is going to go on, you're going to hear a lot of that because there are players in this class who I think are great technicians, guys who really win with their hands, really win with leverage, really win with their pass rush arsenal, their moves, their high football IQ, their fundamentals, everything. But they might not be the best athlete. And that means that maybe there's some players who are a little bit higher, a little bit lower than them. And so uh, it's always a great conversation. So, but you want to start this one off? What we can do is, because we're not going to go as in-depth as we did for wide receiver, just because there are more wide receivers. We want to talk about our top 10s. But we figured a good way to do this would be to go 10 to 6. You kind of list off your guys. We'll have a back and forth conversation. And then I'll give you my 10 to 6. And then we'll really get into the weeds with the players that we have in the top five. Yeah, I think that's the easiest way to do it. And this is a funny position group because there are some pairings in this one, like guys that like pass rush tandems or guys that are just playing in the same front seven. Um, But you want me to take this one away? 10 yeah. to 6. Yeah, so go ahead. 10 for me was uh and I, let me clarify this too. Brandon Dorless, Trevor and I are both going to have him as a D-line. So if you are a big yeah. Brandon Dorless Oregon him, yeah. guy, don't panic that he's not on the show. I think we've both been pretty high on him. He'll yep. be evaluated evaluated with the interior defensive lineman. I'm going to start here at 10 with Adiza Isaac, Penn State pass rusher that is not Chop Robinson. He had himself a really, really nice year. Two years removed from significant injury. Looks like the player everybody thought he could be. Mm -hmm. Next up, Jack Sawyer, Ohio State. Uh, Kind of a jack of all trades. Not really a pass rush artist, but definitely a really good player in the front seven. Number eight, Chris Braswell from Alabama. A guy that plays with Dallas Turner, who people are really, really high on. Braswell is that other edge. And if you're you heard all these names over summer scouting, if you've been with us that long. Uh, JT Tui Maloal is next up for me at okay. seven uh, or six. No, seven. Yeah, he, I mean, he, I, he, I'm good at math. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's number seven. This is going great. He's number seven. <laughs> so, and then number six was Braylon Trice from Washington, a man that can have like 16 pressures in a game playing in the pack when he runs in one of those pass happy teams. So, uh, Trevor, I'm very curious to hear yours, and then we could have an open discussion about this group. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be having a discussion about a couple of these guys, and it'll intertwine a little bit. Um, so 10, I have Jack Sawyer uh, for, from Ohio State. I've got him at number 10. Um, really good run defender, really good all-around athlete. I just don't know if he's high ceiling in any area, so we can get into that, and we can talk about that. Nine, I actually have this teammate, JT Tui Maloau from Ohio State, Sort of the same thing. I I think that JT Tui Maloa is a little bit better of an athlete, a little bit bigger, has a little bit more length to him, which gives him the edge over Sawyer, who Sawyer actually graded out higher than Tui Maloa did. But I think both of those guys, former five stars, I think they're good, solid football players. But I think there's some guys above this list who um who have a little bit higher ceilings than they do. Did you watch Jonah Ellis from Utah? Yes. He, okay, so did he make the top 10 or was he just not in the yes. top 10? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I got Joe. So I have Jonah Ellis at eight. Um, and then I have, I have chop Robinson at seven. Wow. Seven. Yeah. 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 And I know, I know we're going to, we're going to have the chop Robinson conversation a lot. Like we had the Keon Coleman conversation. Oh, I have him man. at seven and then I have Braylon Trice at six. So, okay. So I guess I want to start with this so he doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Isaac did not make your top 10, or is he in the top five? Isaac did make my top 10. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty big time. Um, Okay, so we'll save that. We'll save him and Ellis, because those are obviously guys that made our top 10s that we each uh, have in different places. I I think we open it up with Chop and then the Ohio State guys. Sure, sure. I mean, I'll give you the floor because this is the lowest I've seen somebody on Chop Robinson. And I understand, like, he, listen, he's not ex- insanely far away from me, from you. I'm not going to, I'm going to tease it up. Like, he's not number one for me. Okay. So, what is he, five? He's four. Okay. So, he's four. All right. So, Chop Robinson, Penn State, five star edge rusher, 
insane athlete. Sick he, name. He sick. sick Good as that name. Yeah, no question about <laughs> it. Um, his he was nicknamed Pork Chop, I think, by his dad, um, or somebody when he was a baby, and then they just shortened it to Chop because they couldn't call him Pork Chop for much longer. Because then he j- probably just became like this ripped athlete when he got to high school and was playing football. But the nickname kind of stuck, so now it's just Chop. It was shortened from Pork Chop. Now it's just Chop. So it is a sick name. There's no doubt about it. He's got a sick throwback pass rusher aesthetic. Wears. 44, no gloves, long sleeve. I mean, he's just – so you love to see that. He was in – to give you an idea of how athletic this guy is, he was in Bruce Feldman's Freak List article, clocked at a 4.47 40-yard dash. And he is – just to give you guys a an idea, he is six foot three, 250 pounds. So he's clocked at a 447, which I looked things up on mock draftable. That would be the 98th percentile of edge rushers. He had a 422 short shuttle, which would be 88th percentile. And he also had a broad jump of 10 foot 7 inches, which would be in the 93rd percentile. Oh, by the way, he can also bench press over 400 pounds. When you look at some PFF statistics from him, and I'm, I'm, I'm listing off a lot of the good. Pass rush grade. Now, this is, again, over the last two years, it was like wide receivers. Bigger sample size matters. So I go 2022 and 2023. He had a pass rush grade of 93.9 over the last two years combined. Pass pass rush grade on true passing sets. So that's, you know, you're taking out like RPOs, you're taking out quick stuff. This is when the quarterback is doing an actual drop back. So it's a real pass rush rep that matters. It's not just to get the ball out of the hands quick. 92.6 92.6 pass rush grade, pass rush win percentage, 20.9%. That's in the 97th percentile. Uh, run defense grade, pretty good as well, 77.4%. Run stopping percentage, 7.4. And he had a wins above average score for us of 0.24, which is pretty high. Um, the highest was actually last season. So not this season, but last season, he had a 0.35. He had a little bit lower of a wins above replacement average this year. This is a crazy athlete. It does not take you very long to see that. The problem is, for me, when he does not win off of athleticism, what am I getting from him? Because a lot of people will talk about Chop Robinson and they'll be like, yeah, I mean, he didn't have the best production, but he's a crazy athlete. So It's like, all right. You think that gets easier at the NFL level? No. If you, if if Robinson is a story for me of somebody who wins off basically athleticism alone right now. There's not a lot of pass rush moves to him. He's not really swiping the hands away. He doesn't really do that. He doesn't have great length or leverage. He's got a sick first step. He's got great pursuit speed. I think he's got good flexibility. He's got good change of direction. Like all that as an athlete, he's fantastic. But he doesn't have a lot of pass rush moves. He does not have a lot of pass rush counters. If he doesn't win with athleticism, yes. he's not getting off the block. And he 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 was not he wasn't as bendy as like I I I feel like some people talk about him to be. If he does not win with his first step, here's the thing. He's not winning. And the thing is that he is so physically gifted with that first step that he won a lot. A 20.9% pass rush win percentage is really damn good. But I went back and and I actually looked this up because I have this in my scouting summary of him. Most of his backfield production comes from feasting off of inferior offensive tackles. Because if you go to Chop Robinson's PFF profile, it is a it, it is a roller coaster of boomer bust statistics. I mean, he's got games where he's winning. He's got a passer's win percentage of like 50. He's got like two games in the 50s. He's got three games in the 40s. He's got two games in the 30s. It's like, holy cow, man. If you have passer's win percentages this high, a bunch of them, I, I'm actually wondering how, how are you only a 20%? Like, how are you not like something even crazy right. higher? And it, it And it caused me to do some more research on the offensive tackles that he went up against. So I went back and I I watched all of his pressures of the games in which he recorded more than a 30% pass rush win percentage. Actually, I think it was just, I think it was a 20. 
So we had one, two, three, four, five, six games in 2022 where that was the case. And you had four games this season where we recorded a pass rush win percentage above 20%. Of all of the offensive tackles that he recorded a pressure on, only two of them, two, had pass blocking grades above 66%, or or, or, or pass rush grades, pass blocking grades above 66 for the season. Everybody else, man, that he went up against, that he feasted on, 65.4, 36.2, 40.3, 61.1, These are pass pass blocking grades for the whole season, 57.5, 56.1, 54.4, 33.4. So a lot of Chop Robinson's production, a lot of these crazy reps have come from offensive tackles that are not going to be playing in the league. They're not good offensive. Now, there are a couple in there. There there are two in there that have graded really well with pass rush above above 70, a score of 70. And he got those guys a couple times. And I I don't want to take anything away from him in that regard. But I get really scared when he's got short strides in his legs. He doesn't really win with length. He doesn't have, I, I don't think he has long arms. He's not as bendy as he is twitchy. And if he does not demolish you to the outside or, I mean, let's face it. There are plenty of reps where people can show him using his quickness inside against guards and centers. Of course, he's going to destroy those guys. (laughs) They're a lot slower. But the true edge rush one-on-one snaps against good offensive tackles, there's just not a lot of it. And For a player who is as physically gifted as Chop Robinson is, he does not have the production that makes you very confident to think that he's still going to be able to do stuff like that at the NFL level. Could he get way better with his hands? Because his hands are fast and violent. Could he get way better with his hands and become an absolute technician where guys can't even get hands on him? Because if that's the case, yeah, he's blown by a lot of these guys and he's going to be a really successful pro. But... He's just so one-dimensional right now. After two years of starting at Penn State, he is so one-dimensional with his athleticism that, like we even said during the wide receiver episode, right? The NFL is the best of the best. It's really, really hard, even for the best athletes. Like, people look at Micah Parsons and they go, oh, what about Micah Parsons? Micah Parsons got moves, man. Micah Parsons will set you up. Micah Parsons knows what he's doing. That's that's not the same type of prospect that we're talking about here, at least for the way that Chop Robbins is going to be going into the NFL. So I understand people are going to yell at me for this because he is a crazy athlete. And like you said at the beginning of the podcast, you bet on crazy athletes. His 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 grade for me is is not going to be lower than uh, like a second round pick, late second round pick. I think at the very worst. But in terms of him versus some of the other guys that we're going to talk about later in the show, these other guys do it a lot more in, in a more translatable way to me and a lot more consistently than chop Robinson did. So that's how I see him. It's interesting. I think the picture that's been illustrated of chop compared to what he is tells a lot of different stories, right? I, I think you're definitely on the low end. I would classify myself right in the middle and then there'll be people on the high end. I just dropped the top 75 for NBC sports. Mm. He was not in my top 20, but I still like a lot of things about Chop because, number one, he's still 20 years old as we're recording this podcast. So this is a guy that is a starter for Penn State for the last two years, but doing it at a really, really young age where he'll play basically his entire rookie season in the NFL as a 21-year-old. So I think that's a positive. I think he'll get – I think there's a lot of time for him to develop. Now, if you need somebody to come in and be effective right away – he's going to be set up to fail because you made the point Trevor that there's not a lot of counter moves with him. Like he's got the burst off the snap is phenomenal. And I think he has bend, but to your point, it's not this like rare elite bend. I think it's because he rushes so low and he has so much burst that he creates angles for himself, corners for himself that a lot of guys can't like a lot of guys are that don't have this kind of burst but can bend, you see it because they have to do that. But with Chop, it feels like he knows how to create his own rush lanes. Um, 
I would like to see more pass rush moves. I, I remember going all the way back to my summer notes, like watching him thrown to the ground all the time against Dewan Jones was something that really frustrated me. Du- the Dewan Jones, I made sure to go back and I watched right. the Dewan Jones film, and it's like, all right, that's an NFL offensive tackle. Now, yeah, Dewan Jones, thing. now Dewan Jones is a you know, 99th, 98th percentile guy when it comes to like wingspan and everything. But that was an example of he could not get around Dewan Jones at all. And there, there are some, and I was in this camp a little bit myself, where it's like, oh, you're drafting this guy off of traits no matter what, basically yep. in the top half of the first round. And I just don't know if that's really the case. Uh, he's he to me, he's just so one dimensional. Uh, even with that one dimension being athleticism, I did I just didn't see enough uh, outside of that man. I just didn't. Yeah, see no, I get it. The thing is, guys like this will always go early because for every miss, there are examples over the years. I think back to and this isn't the right comp, but in terms of looking for more production and dominance, Daniel Hunter is a guy that I remember when he got drafted or people really liked him in the draft. And this is a long time ago. It was like, man, he wasn't that productive, but he's only 20. He's kind of a freak. Will that green light come on? And when it did, you start to see why teams do this, right? I think that, I mean, you just go back, the edge rushers drafted over the years. There, there's reaches all the time, and he is a boomer bust pick because he has not turned into that snap by snap dominant pass rusher because he doesn't have the full plan unlocked. But he's young enough where you think you could develop the plan, and he's athletic enough that, like, this is what the elite athletes, the position look like. His combine right. will be out of this world. No, It'll it's be out be of crazy. this world. It's but the, pro- the problem is why he comes at number four for me is there's a guy that's more productive and a freak athlete ahead of him. And then the other two guys are athletic enough for me that their Mm -hmm. production cannot be ignored. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going to hurt chop is that in some classes you have to take the risk because there might not be somebody else there in that spot. But in this class, there are guys that maybe aren't the same athlete, but they're good enough from an athletic threshold standpoint that have been insanely dominant over the span of college football for the last two years. So I think, I think about Vic Beasley when I think about chop Robinson, because Vic was a crazy athlete and goes, I think, number eight. Yeah, number eight of the of the 2015 NFL draft because of it. Beasley had four sacks his first season as a rookie, had 15 and a half. So weird that the year. next season. And then he went five sacks, five sacks, eight sacks. And then he's out of the league. Well, he's now a one dimensional guy, too. You couldn't even get like anything out of him besides but, that but that's what I'm, that's what i'm wor- that's what i'm worried about right of course yeah there's because, bus potential here no one's denying that that's, that's what i see it i i think about vic beasley when i see chop robinson and is that somebody that you still probably draft in the top 50 yeah probably um even even with that him not living up to expectations just because he's a great athlete but he's it's not a it's not a one for one he has the exact same game as beasley but v beasley was the crazy athlete um who people bet on it hit for one season that sophomore season and it didn't hit again and so that's it just worries me when you're that one dimensional about. Yeah. It. You know, so. what's wild with Vic before his final college season, like the two years leading up to that, he had 21 sacks. Like Vic, Vic dominated college football. I and dude and chop. He doesn't. He doesn't. I dude, agree. He, he doesn't. doesn't. But the, he, but the he, flashes are. Brilliant. He doesn't even he doesn't even with tackles for loss. No. Like he he had 10 tackles for loss in 2022. He had five and a half sacks. This past season, he had seven and a half tackles for loss and four sacks. Like it just, that's not, he has, he in, in three years of playing, two years of starting, he has 11 and a half sacks. That's like. But to be I, fair, he got hurt this year. And I do wonder, and, I do want, because we don't get a lick of new, we don't even know like concussion, upper body, lower body. No idea. He missed two games. He was down on the field a while for that injury. Like I always, these are the things that I really want to know more about. That's, I don't know, man. I just watched him and got really spooked. I looked yeah. up the tackles that he's gone up against. It's been absolutely feasting on bad offensive tackles. And outside of that, there has not been a lot of production. And but let he, me ask you this. Can't were, in college. Did I, I don't, you like David Ajabo? Relatively. Yeah. Okay. Because I feel like he obviously got hurt, and that hurt his draft stock. 
But he was somebody that was a flashy guy for a little bit in college, but was you were really drafting the athlete. I, I, I'm just saying that, like, yeah, this is Ojabo, Ojabo was at least bigger and taller. Like, I, I, was he? So Ojabo was six. Uh, let me look. I'm talking like like college because you know these Penn State guys coming into the combine. Ajabo plays at 265 now, but I'm talking as a prospect. I mean, Michigan has him listed as six. He was 250 at the combine. So he's six foot four. I even think the chop's smaller than that. Okay. And I I I don't I think I think he was gonna lose the length battle also more than you do, it seems. I think he's average in terms of that department. Also, Ojabo in his last year at Michigan still had 12 tackles for loss and 11 sacks. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> but just... you were betting on the athlete with that pick. It wasn't like a refi- – I remember that tape. Right. It was like right. watching an but ISO that, basketball player. But, th- but that's what I'm saying. You don't, you understand what I'm saying? Like, y- y- I agree with you that you're betting on the athlete in both of these cases, but we were betting on the athlete of David Ojabo, and he still gave us double-digit tackles for loss and yeah. double-digit sacks. We didn't. We didn't even get half of that with Chop Robinson. Yeah, I think at the end for me, I would I'm take him spooked. at the end of the first round. I still would. I'm just spooked, man. Yeah, spooked. I, okay. I just yeah. Well, let's get to the Ohio State guys because I don't okay. want to. I don't want to lose sight of them. Um, my honest evaluation, boring, and I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> like they, they are going to be longtime NFL players, and. They might not be guys that every kid in the stand is wearing jerseys of, but they might be guys that can play every down. They have good hands. I'll start with Sawyer first before I go to Tui Malowau. Okay. Sawyer, you said it best. Like, he's not great at anything. I called him a jack of all trades. He's got a well-built body. He's got short arms. He plays every rep very hard. Uh, He has a power profile to him that, I think plays at the next level. He can stack and shed and get off blocks against the run. Like he could set the edge that like everybody, this is good. This is the perfect contrast to the chop combo. We just had everybody wants to get in a sports car and go 120 miles an hour down the highway. Mm-hmm. But like, sometimes you need the pickup truck to set the edge, play the run, play boring ass first and second down and get the team into third and nine. So the Ferraris can start driving off the edge. Mm -hmm. That is Sawyer to me in a nutshell. Like it really, really is. This is a dude that will do everything asked of him and it won't always be pretty. He'll probably have six effort sacks when he's playing at his best at the NFL level. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then with Tui Malowau, he's a little bit more fascinating because he's not overly productive. But he's the only guy in the world, it feels like, that can give Fashanu an interesting rep here or there. Right. Like, Tui Malowu has tape against good tackles that he wins. But it's so fascinating to me. He's not a dominant snap-by-snap pass rusher at all. He's honestly probably the smartest edge, edge I watched in this group. Like instincts and awareness and hand usage. He's, he is. Yeah. And with his eyes, um, just like Sawyer, the effort's phenomenal. I don't really see light feet. These guys both don't bend. They're not flexible. Like they're going to have to stick their hands in your chest and push you back. Eight out of the 10 reps there. You know, I've seen sometimes them try things like a spin or maybe a long arm, but their game is predicated on power and leverage, but they're really good at it and they get off blocks and they know how to keep hands off of them. And they are going to be starters at the NFL level. They just will never be double digit sack players in my eyes. Yeah, I agree with you. I I, I think I see them pretty much similarly similarly to the way that you do. I, I could just read my um read my little blurs for both of these guys because it's pretty much the same thing. Sawyer's a smart, strong defensive end prospect who brings all around ability to the position. He's got a high floor as a player due to his consistent, strong hand usage, especially in run defense. His hands are fast and precise inside to dictate contact and not yield ground versus the run. He also has a good understanding of pass rush plans, both inside and out, strength and speed. I saw him in multiple games 
have like go for the outside rush a couple of times and then perfectly time an inside counter or you know go with speed a couple of times and then perfectly counter just when the tackle oversets to take with the speed boom those hands come inside all of a sudden they're on skates and he's pushing them straight to the lap of the quarterback so i love that he's also rarely fooled or out of position i think sawyer's first step is adequate especially out of a three-point stance when he can get low but the pursuit speed like Step number four, five, six, r- below average. Pickup truck. That's it's definitely below average. And if he was better in that area, I think I might have him significantly higher on that list. But just outside of that first burst, there's not a lot that's happening after that. He'll also likely lose the length battle against most NFL offensive tackles. Likely won't be a takeover pass rusher, but for how strong and reliable he is, and he's got a high floor as a three down player. Um, and then Tui Malo out. Smart football player, has fantastic instincts, even as just a true junior, which manifests in clutch pass breakups on screens and against quick passes. He's a good all-around athlete for a player who's 6'4", 270. Shows that by how comfortable he is and how often he can win with leverage from a two- and a three-point stance. His go-to moves, definitely the long arm or the extended arm bull rush. He likes to use his length and he likes to just you know get people back in the lap of the quarterback, but also has a pretty nice spin move counter he likes to use. Shows good technique for run defense. Um, but is not always this is something that 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 was a hang up for him i think he's got good technique for run defense but he's not always dictating with his strength i noted this e- even tight ends sometimes like would tie him up and it's like dude you i mean you got to be able to push pull this tight end this guy weighs 20 less pounds than you you got to be able to get him off and it just didn't see that aggressiveness and urgency with him um i think the athleticism is adequate all around but it also kind of feels a little bit low ceiling with him at times. So these are both just really steady, good football players. When it comes to the flash, the high, are they going to be you know, potential takeover types of pass rushers? I'm not sure that they're going to be that. So I agree with your assessment completely. I think they're really solid football players. They're going to be rotational players in the league at worst. But both of these guys could eventually be starters at the NFL level. Okay, let's talk about Chris Braswell since we okay. both had him – uh, on our six to 10, he's a guy that 2022, two and a half sacks, five hits, 21 hurries, 18.4% pass rush win rate. The numbers go up in 23, eight sacks, 10 quarterback hits, 31 more hurries, but the pass rush win rate stays the same 18.6%. So it got a little yeah. better, right? Um, he's someone that got a little bit more opportunity to me, Trevor. He's just got legit power and effort as a rusher. Oh, like yeah. I, I saw the long arm. I saw the speed to power. I saw the bull rush. Even when the arms and legs are flying all over the place, like the effort just goes like he's always trying because, you know, those guys on the back end, whether it's Taron Arnold or Kool-Aid McKinstry, like they can cover. So Alabama gets some chances for coverage sacks as well. Um, I think with him, the one frust- thing that left me frustrated was mm-hmm. for how much power he has as a rusher. I didn't think he was a, a strong run defender. Like I, I didn't like I saw him with knockback power when he got a runway. Yeah. As a pass rusher. But when it was time to hold the point of attack on the line of scrimmage, I saw him get pushed back by the better offensive lines. Mm-hmm. Like I, I thought he had a good game as a rusher against Auburn and Georgia, but I saw reps against the run where I'm like, man, he gets blown off the ball in this spot. So I think I was left wondering if he's a little bit of a not one dimensional, but you uh, true power rusher, but not a great run defender. I just saw a little bit of a limited role for him. And maybe that's why Alabama's had him in a limited role before this year. Yeah. You know, that part of it is, is interesting, right? Is did he not play nearly as much last year because it was simply Will Anderson was in right. front of him. You know, there's, a lot of talent. There's reps in 2022, and I watched a couple of games from him in 2022, where Dallas Turner, Will Anderson, and Chris Braswell are on the field at the same time. And, and I mean, that's just it's some insane yeah. talent. This dude's a five-star defensive end prospect. It's kind of taken him a little bit. And Nick Saban actually talked about this a little. It it really has taken him until his senior year, which is this year to really feel truly comfortable and confident playing from a stand-up outside linebacker position, right? Because Alabama, their scheme is three down linemen, heavier guys, and then the fourth guy is normally a stand-up pass rusher. So 
you know, that would, that would be Will Anderson, or it, it kind of depends on the, the personnel that you have on the field. But Braswell came in as a defensive end prospect, and he weighed a lot less. I think he's put on, I think I read this, like 30 or, 30 or 35 pounds since he got to Alabama. But he came in as a hand-in-the-dirt defensive end prospect. Well, he was going to have to gain weight anyways, but Alabama's defensive ends, I mean, they're not playing at 255 where he's currently playing. Alabama's defensive ends are playing at 275, 280. They're, they're playing much bigger. So he had to kind of learn and be comfortable with uh, that outside linebacker role, rushing more from a two-point stance. And you can just tell he's a lot more comfortable from that. I have him at number four because I'm just I was so impressed by this dude's athletic ability and, and it's kind of funny because even though I have him at four and I have chop at seven some of the conversations are going to be a little bit the same although I like Braswell's flexibility a little bit better and I actually think that Braswell's got longer arms and so the big he the, does the big difference of where I have Braswell versus where I have chop is I think chop's not going to lose the length battle nearly as much. And I think he's a little bit more flexible than, uh, than chop Robinson, which means the world as an athletic pass rusher, this dude, I absolutely love this first step. You mentioned the 18.5% pass rush win percentage. That's in the 94th percentile. He had a 20.3 pass rush win percentage, I believe in 2023, which is um, 94th percentile as well. This, unless I'm reading the wrong thing, but I, I think it might actually. I had him at 18.6, but it's close. That's close. From, okay. Okay. So that was, yeah, yeah, here we go. I'm just going to take this out now that it's the middle of the show. Cause so I don't get confused next time. Run defense grade though. You're right. 64, 65.6 run defense grade cumulative over the last couple of seasons. Uh, his best win above replacement average was obviously this past year. Cause he played the most and he had the biggest um, impact on the team, but that was 0.16. I think that this is absolutely the type of athlete that you draft and develop. Uh, the way that I say this at the end of his scouting summary that I have is even if he does not become a technician of a pass rusher, his raw power, speed, and length present a rotational role at worst and an impact starter at best. So the way that this guy you mentioned, it, it, it is funny that you said – this is a power guy because I agree with you. He is, he is kind of a power yeah. guy, but he's a power guy because it's not because he like weighs a ton. He's like 250, 255 pounds. He's a power dude because he gets off the ball with so much explosiveness. Yeah, that runway. Who's, dude, who's going to blow up the combine. This guy's 10 yard split to, I think should be insane. The way that he, that he is able to use speed to power. It is a go-to move of his. So, to me, he, his scouting reports a lot like Chop Robinson and the fact that these guys both need to be better with their hands. They need to be better with their hand timing, their hand placement. They need to have a better mastery of pass rush moves, even if it's just speed moves. Better pass rush moves need to be more comfortable with the club rip, with uh, the swipe and dip, like whatever it is. Um, but like I said, He's got the longer length. I don't think he's losing that the way the chop is. And I actually think he's got more flexibility. So that's why I had him at number four, very similarly to the reasons why you and a lot of other people I know are going to love chop Robinson. I just saw less deficiencies with Braswell. So that's kind of how I saw those guys. Okay. So then we move into, well, to Braylon Trice. Where did you have Trice? So I had Trice at six. So did I. Okay. I'm um, sure we saw, I think we saw him the same over summer. Um, you want to start with Trice? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Trice, uh, Washington edge rusher, six foot three, 270 pounds. Thick dude. Yeah. Thick. So, you, and you like that he's got that higher weight on him because he is a crash straight into you type of a player. I said this in my scouting report. Trice is a disruption is production kind of a player. His sack totals over the last couple of years, relatively low compared to some of his peers, but his name is near the top of the list in total pressures forced. He loves the physical part of playing the game. He's also got over 1400 snaps over the last two years. I mean, this guy's on the field a lot. So they trust him as a run defender. They trust him as a pass rusher. Everything, man. Um, he has a really high win above replacement score, average of 0.38, which is 
shoot, that might be the highest on this list. Latu might be a little bit higher than him. We'll have to see. I got to double check. But he actually had a .40 this year. I mean, he was super impactful. He is somebody who goes all out at all times. Uh, he's going to be a bull rush specialist for you. He's going to go straight into your chest. He's looking to go through you as a pass rush plan. Um, I kind of wish he had a little bit more finesse in his game. And the thing with Trice for me, ultimately the reason why I left him out of the top five is because I love the way he physically plays the game, but you will notice that he has some stiffness to him and some lack of flexibility when it comes to like turning the corner and, you know, like beating the outside at uh, the outside shoulder. Cause you'll watch the Washington game and Washington aligns him in a, more wider alignment like a wide seven a wide nine and it's to give him a straight path to the quarterback he doesn't have to bend the ankle he doesn't have to dip the shoulder it's just more of a straight line right to the quarterback and so if he still gets to kind of have that specialized package role in the nfl i think he could be really successful but i wonder if a team looks at him and says hey six foot three 270 pounds let's put your hand in the dirt we're going to put you as a five technique we're going to put you right above the head of the offensive tackle go win, attack the outside shoulder, and corner him. I don't know how well he's going to be able to do that. He'll still be able to be plenty physical with NFL offensive tackles, but on those speed rush outside shoulder situations, if you don't line him up a little bit further, does he have that flexibility to turn the corner? That's really the big drawback of why I had him outside the top five. Me too. I, when you watch him, I mean, just he's a complete bull in a china shop, right? It's it's wild when you watch him play. There are reps where he literally runs through tackles like they're drywall. It just goes right through them and they collapse to the ground. Right. Um, now, I will give him this kind of credit. He does have some five pitch pitcher in him. And what I mean by that is he doesn't just keep running into guys until they eventually fall back and he gets a sack. He has counters. Like he knows how to get off blocks. He even a couple of times where he was tied up, I saw him spin off blocks. Mm -hmm. I saw him use that long kind of Euro step to counter and cross the face of tackles while creating that outs, uh, that inside rush lane. He's got a nasty little inside step over. You're right. Oh, I, noted, I noted that multiple times. It's, it's kind of like when you go out and play pickup basketball with somebody that looks like you're like you're not really expecting much mm -hmm. and then they have some touch on the jumper and you're like ooh, like that's what it was to me while watching them i was <laughs> like damn you have that like the body, right. <laughs> the body doesn't match that right <laughs> so, right so that was cool man he and i love that you brought up the snap count this guy's played so much football he's just a he's a true workhorse like and that, there's something to that there really is i mean think about the stamina you have to have playing in a conference like this that there's so many offensive plays and he just, he plays, he just plays them all. So Trice, he doesn't have some of the, the shininess that some of the higher end blue chip guys have, but undoubtedly there's a floor with him that you feel really, really good about probably at the top of the second round. Yep. As both a pass rusher and run defender because of the power profile. But when he throws in those changeups there, to cross your face inside, he keeps tackles honest. I, I I think that he's a he's a really nice player, man. I don't know I don't know where he's going to end up going. I don't know if the NFL is going to look at him and see some of those limitations and say, nah, he's not a first round pick, or if right. somebody like end of the first round is going to go, no, no, no. Like you said, defensive line Iron Man loves the physical parts of the game. Like you mentioned, has a little bit more finesse than you would expect. And if that's going to be enough for just somebody to say, yeah, get him in our rotation, I feel like they will. Just, you know, we'll, we'll talk about how much you know, a premium position can really elevate a guy's prospect or a, a guy's scouting report. Like, okay, maybe the film grade says he's a second round player, but he plays edge and he's got these qualities that you love. You'll be okay drafting him at the back end of the first round. I feel like that's going to be Braylon Trice. So I would lean more towards, um, I would lean more towards that towards towards him being back out of the first round guy do you agree yes all right well we got to get our uh, into our top fives but before we do got to talk about securing your family's financial future with our friends over at fabric fabric by gerber life makes it quick easy and affordable to protect your family so you can get back to enjoying everything in life it was designed by parents for parents to help you get high quality surprisingly affordable term life insurance policies in less than 10 minutes 
They got flexible policies that fit your family's budget with quality policies like million dollar coverage for less than a dollar a day. You can get your personalized quote in just minutes and apply whenever it is convenient for you all online into your schedule. You can go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash stock exchange. Meetfabric.com slash stock exchange. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash stock exchange. Just looking out for you guys there with the URL. Just make sure you're not M-E-A-T. Don't know where that goes. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company. Not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. So who haven't we hit in? Do we hit five for you? Uh, five for me is Jonah Ellis. Okay, so I have Jonah Ellis. Where did I have him? Eight, but I'm mad about it. You should be. Yeah, I'm mad about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't. He made won't it be. Before. He won't be eight for you by the end of this thing. No. So I honestly, I had him. Funny enough, like in all seriousness, I had him five before I kept watching some other games because you know, like I'll I'll throw in. I'll type in some of the numbers of the film grade and they'll spit out the, the overall film score that I have for these players after I'll do that after like two or three games. And then I'll probably watch one or two more. And if it changes, I'll tweak something, whatever. So I had him at five, but that just goes to show you the difference is very small between five and eight, because there are a couple points that I lowered him in, in a certain category that I'm sure we'll talk about. I'm curious if you talk about it, but you like him a lot. You got him at number five, Utah edge rusher, Jonah Ellis. What do you think? I mean, if pre-workout was an edge rushing prospect, like this, is, <laughs> this is it right here. It really woke is. AF. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the, the Jack 3D. Yeah, <laughs> of of edge rushers. Jonah Ellis is an absolute lunatic man. He really is, and he's actually uh, one of the best stories of prospects this year. This is somebody that had three sacks last year. He had twelve this year. So, Huge. yeah, an insane jump. Yeah. Now, we'll, we'll save some of the question marks later. We'll just start with him. This is somebody that clearly, and if you know this family, like this family is a football family. So it's no surprise to hear this next part. But this is somebody that really works on his moves and his plan. Mm -hmm. The hand usage, getting off the ball, the spin move put some tackles in a blender it wasn't like where you saw it once and it worked there's a couple of sacks from him that he just completely erases the tackles hands and spins and directly runs right to the quarterback i think he's someone that he it's not that he's overly he's twitchy right like the change of direction he could stutter step mm -hmm. and work around you and club and rip but there's also something to him where I think he gets off the ball well enough and can turn the corner. It's a yes. little tight up top because he's kind of like he's a little muscular up top where it doesn't look as crazy as some guys, but he can turn the corner. You see it in the ankles. You see it in the hips a little bit. And he that's how he really knows how to corner into the pocket when he lands at the quarterback. I mean, it, it's like watching. Uh, you know, like when you like roll out a bed sheet, that's what the quarterback looks like. They go flying like the hits are the like he the strip sacks and stuff on the tape. It's it's different. It's different. He doesn't just land on the quarterback or wrap like he drives through quarterbacks. Um, the tape's really fun, man. It really is. I think that where I, I get a little stuck with him at times is it is a different build. He's listed six two. He's listed two forty six. I don't know if he's six two. I don't think yeah. he, I don't right. I'm leaning more like six feet and a half. Yeah. And I don't think he's while he's in very good shape, he clearly has like Watt family work ethic when you just look at him. And once mm -hmm. again, this guy that comes from a football family, mm -hmm. I'm not betting against him. He's edge rusher five for me. Mm -hmm. But I think there are size limitations that I wonder how he's used at the next level. Like, is this only a three, four stand up guy? Right. That's kind of how I saw him. And a lot of the way that you highlighted, I feel very similarly. 
I have a category called go to moves that I just list a lot of the yeah. effective moves that th- th- these guys have. Him and Latu have the most. Oh, no yeah. question. I mean, I've got written down, and these are moves that I see. This is not just like attempting. I this means I see you do it and pull it off. Push pull move, swim move, two handed swipe, dip and rip, stab and swipe, inside spin, bull rush, and then I have in parentheses wins more with technique than strength because that kind of ultimately gets into my conversation about him. This dude was awesome this past year. If you just look at 2023, 90.1 pass rush grade, 91.3 pass rush grade on true pass sets, 17.9 pass rush win percentage, uh, and a wins above replacement score of uh, a 0.16. The family background you mentioned, his dad played in the NFL, um, 10-year vet, uh, played for the Lions and the Broncos, I believe. Now, his dad, funny enough, so I wondered about this as I was going through his scouting report, because there's so much that I really like about Ellis. Like, I think that he, I think him, Isaac, and um, Dallas Turner actually might have like the best natural corner ability. I'd throw a lot to in there as well. Like in yeah. this class, you know, and these are guys who just understand angles and cornering doesn't just have to do with how flexible your angles are. Like it, it, it also has to do with you being a master of let's say you're doing like a little club rip move right let's say you you swipe the hands away with the club and then you bring the hand up to rip it's also about not just your your flexibility but also your weight distribution you know you leaning up against the offensive tackle shoulder and then the then his and then his outside shoulder and then the back a little bit and you are almost like slingshotting yourself with momentum around the corner so cornering is an art as much as it is an athletic and flexibility gift that some of these guys have and i think that ellis does it really really well so his dad i mentioned former nfl player was actually a defensive tackle and his dad was like 315 his dad was like 65 315 and I think his brother is too no i looked up his, his brother he's got a couple brothers christian and caden who caden plays in the nfl now i think christian did i don't think christian does anymore both of them were like six foot two, 235 pounds, like 230, 235 pounds. Okay. Jonah is listed at six, two, 246. No, I'm talking about Noah. Do you oh, know, what, the, do you know did, Noah? No, what did Noah weigh? I didn't, I didn't, no, I didn't have Noah. Noah is 367. Wait, what? Yeah. He's the size of a tractor trailer. Does he play in the league? Noah is on the Eagles practice squad. Okay, so the Eagles have him and Christian. Is Christian still there? Uh, let's see. Christian is on the active roster for the Patriots. Oh, so he's with the Patriots now. Yeah, the, no, Noah, Noah is the beefy child. Dude, what the hell? Okay, yeah. so this might help me. This might actually <laughs> elevate Jonah Ellis into the top five because the thing that I'm actually worried about the most, I love so much about his game. But I think that there are there are strength deficiencies. If he goes up against double teams, if it's a tackle and a tight end against him, he's getting blown off the ball. And there are a lot, there are other tight, just straight up offensive tackles that he went up against. Now, this is worse in 2022 than it was in 2023 because he got better at getting off blocks, but he didn't get off blocks necessarily with strength. It's not like he was holding his own as much. I've got strength concerns with Ellis, and it's just overall weight concerns. And there's a line that I have at the end of his scouting summary that says in order for him to remain a difference maker, like he was in 2023, he will have to get stronger. If he can get to around 255 to 260 pounds and remain as quick and flexible as he is now, we're talking about an impactful pass rush. Yep. But if not, then you're right. That he's probably just a rotational stand up outside linebacker, which is fine. I mean, he's still clearly gifted enough to be able to do that. He understands the game really well enough to be able to do that, but it's, the edge rush group that we have here is pretty damn good. And so for me to put him above that, that is the area. Cause it is a, it is a strong person's game, man. The NFL is, you gotta be strong to play in the NFL. And we'll get to that in a little bit with some of the guys that I have ranked higher here, but for Ellis to be more than a specialized pass rusher, I need him at like 255, 5, 260. So I looked at his dad and I said, his dad got over 300 pounds. I believe, I believe that Jonah can get 255, 260. And you tell me that his brother's like, what was he? 
he's 367. I think at the combine, he was 347. This I love that me, I found this, another this brother. Based just on, to, I found a brother you didn't even know existed just to push you into the hope for Jonah. <laughs> yeah, Ellis. that would that. So that's that's my thoughts on him. I agree with you. He's fantastic with the hands, understands the game so well, plays a million miles an hour, competitive toughness, man. He's just he he's got the IQ, the toughness, the the the, the speed like he's got all that stuff. I just I need I need I need some more weight from him. I need right. some more strength from his profile. We're uh, entering. What prospect am I thinking of from last year? Oh my god, I just froze. He went to the Steelers. Come Nate on, Herbig. say it again. Herbig. Yes, Nate Herbig. Yes, that's yeah, exactly who I'm thinking of. We're entering that territory where I'm like, not Nate Herbig. That's his brother, Nick. Nick Herbig. Right? God, there's so many football families these days. <laughs> yes, Nick Herbig's the one. Nick Herbig. Like, yes. Right? But and, and so like Nick Herbig went in the fourth round. Exactly. I wouldn't be shocked if Jonah ends up going in like the third round, but everybody just loves him. Like all the draft pundits and fans are like sky rules. Nick Herbig was a little over six foot two and 240 pounds at the combine. That could be Jonah Ellis. Jonah's got away more than that. He's gonna he's gonna come in heavier. He's gonna come in, I think, two. I think he'll come in two fifty five. Let's go, baby. And yeah. then if he tests well at two fifty five, well, that's to better. the moon. Yeah, to the moon <laughs> by all the stock. To the moon, baby. All right. All right. So uh, five for me is Adiza Isaac. Okay. Now Isaac is five for me based on his film score being really strong, and I think it's just because he's really solid in all areas, man. Yeah, he is. There, there's there's nothing that he's really. I, I don't know if there's. I mentioned how well he cornered, but again, like that was more from a. I just really like the way that he plays the game, kind of a thing. Because you look at his pass rush grades, seventy four point six over the last two years uh, on true pass sets is it, it's better. It's almost in the eighty seventy nine point two. But the pass rush win percentage, you know, like it's low. It's fifty eighth percentile. It's just thirteen point one. You know, the wins above uh, above average is going to be low, too, because he's not necessarily impacting the game as an individual. But I think his best ball is ahead of him. You know, I think that not 2023, but 2022 was the first year that he was coming off the Achilles tear injury. OK, so a little bit of reservations there this year. I felt like he was confident, man. I thought I, I he, he consistently went to the club rip move, and I thought that he did it very, very well. He also something that I loved about him is. He'd hit a cross chop really well. And like that's kind of like an advanced pass rush move. Like you gotta be, you gotta be pretty confident to be able to hit one of those. And I thought he he did that very well. I also felt like he did, you know, like he, he would kind of use a variation of that and he'd do a little step over like a cross, but it'd just go straight into a rip move. I felt like just the rip move was was something that was continuously um, successful for him. Really solid run defender. And this guy was on the field more than Chop Robinson was because Penn State didn't want to take him off the field, especially on early downs. So this is a three down type of alignment kind of kind of a dude. He is six foot four, 250 pounds. So would like for him to get a little bit better. And what's kind of interesting is he does a lot of work as a stand-up edge rusher, but I actually think his skill set's a lot better for like a hand in the dirt defensive end. So there's a little bit of a projection there because Penn State has him stand up a lot. Can he be more of that full-time hand of the dirt five technique kind of a player? If he does, he's probably going to need to gain a little bit more weight for it, which can allow him to be stronger, which is one of the, again, detractors that I had in his scouting report. But the rest of it, man, love the hands. Fast and violent hands for swipes and pass rush situations. Consistent hand placement to win inside, gain leverage. That's why he holds the point of attack well. That's why he's a really good run defender. That's why the bull rushes are very effective for him because he's dictating that contact. And he's gaining the leverage on those dudes. I think he is really strong when he's taking on those split zone blockers that are coming across the line of scrimmage. He's given no, uh, he's given no space there. He's setting the edge there for any kind of cutback, anything like that. Man, I, I just believe that with the corner ability, the hands. I think that I think that his best ball is ahead of him, man. I just think he's a really, really solid football player, and that's why I got him at five. I liked him a lot. I had him at ten out of our pass rushers, but he was sixty-two on my big board. And I agree with you that the trajectory is going the right way with him. He mm -hmm. tore the Achilles in two thousand twenty-one. Two years removed, he looks so much better. Um, he could do a lot of different things too, which is you know, obviously very helpful of him. You brought up the run defense. I think he's athletic enough to even, you know, drop at times if he needed him to in coverage, just as his own dropper. 
and keep in mind these are great things for stunts i like isaac a lot and, and i feel like you can kind of throw five through ten in a bag and shake it up and like you can make an argument in a different way for any of them in those spots so i totally see where you are with that one all right, I think uh, I think our top threes match, but I am curious of the order of top threes. I do think not to you know like totally give you a teaser, but I do think it will surprise some people. Before we get to that, got to talk to you about our friends over at DraftKings. NFL fans, it's time to unwrap nonstop football action this holiday season. Throw down on big matchups with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. This week, new customers can bet just five dollars on the NFL and get one hundred fifty in instant instantly in in the bonus bets that you get there just from signing up and putting five dollars on the line we got some we got some good nfl lines here like i i just have them up right now arizona getting four points against the bears kind of like it kind of like it there raiders actually getting 10 points against the chiefs raiders kind of playing well i'm just saying tommy devito getting 12 points against the eagles i'm just saying you know, there's some ju- there's some juicy matchups here. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the promo code PFF. New customers can bet that $5 in- on any NFL action and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Uh, only on DraftKings Sportsbook with the promo code PFF. The crown is yours. If you got a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, you can call 778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. Uh, in Connecticut, help is available for gambling at 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Boyd in Ontario. Bonus bets expire for the 168 hours after they are issued. See dkng.com slash football for eligibility, deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. All right, who you got a three? I see you sneaking in the Tommy DeVito reference in there. I I just want to. I'm not supposed to. No, I just want to say the mainstream media doesn't want you to know that actually Vincent Trocek is the best Italian American New York athlete. I'm not supposed to. Who are all my hockey bros out? Do I know who that is? Am I supposed to? Yeah, he's the Rangers center on the Rangers. Nah, Rangers are trash. Doesn't matter. I'm not paying attention. (laughs) Trash. in the metro <laughs> oh my god anyways number three <laughs> can't believe this dallas turner for me okay um, all right let me start it off this way dallas turner answered so many of my questions i had about him from the summer mm-hmm. he got bigger he got stronger he took over games Dallas Turner is my third edge rusher on the board, but he's my number 11 player overall. I was going to ask how close you had these guys because I have these guys pretty damn oh, close. He, I'll really tell you right now, 11, 10, and 8. Okay, so who's two Like who's two and one? Just Verse, verse and then Latu. So you have Latu at one? Okay. Yep. So I actually have Latu at three. Um, okay. And the reason why I have Latu at three is just because – I think there are some physical limitations with Latu when it comes to explosiveness I and, when, and when it comes to length, like those two things I do feel are going to be adequate at best, but might even be below average for him. Now that doesn't change what kind of an impactful pass rusher that he has been. We've said multiple times in this podcast, there's been nobody in college football that has been more productive as a pass rusher than, than Latu Latu from UCLA over the last two years. And he's still six foot five, 265 pounds. So he's still got like a bigger frame where some of these guys a little bit lower. Okay. Maybe I'm worried about the length a little bit. Maybe I'm worried about the strength a little bit, the explosiveness a little bit, but this dude's still a big smooth athlete. He's just not getting off the ball as fast as some of these other players. He's not as dense as some of these other players when he's trying to crash into them, things like that. So I, I, I do, I, I have lot two at three. You got lot two at one. I, I do like him a lot, but there are some explosiveness and length limitations that he has that I'm I don't really have a concern with with the other two guys. Right, and I get that. I completely do, and I I think I'm going to be honest here. The combine is going to be really big for a lot too, dude. If I, it's like I, it, this, I considering I have Turner at eleven versus ten and Latu at eight. With a drastic, drastic, drastic combine, you know, showing in terms of differences, like Turner can easily flip with Latu. Mm-hmm. I, I thought Turner against Auburn looked like Micah Parsons. 
I was like, <laughs> I, like I was like, this is the guy I've been waiting for that I always knew he could be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, if if Latu runs, if if Latu runs anything, been four seven and four seven five of the forty yard dash. I swear, I will rise this man so high up the draft board, it might be a crime. Uh, no, so but that's really like all I'm looking for because you know how much I love Latu. But getting back to Dallas Turner, I agree with you completely. That's why he's won for me. Yeah, and I get it. I like <laughs> I I totally get it. I Dude, might land there at the end of this thing. So I watch, like I said, the way that I go about this process is I try to watch uh, at least four, uh, try to watch five games of all these players, two of which come from the previous season. And then I try to watch at least three of the current season, knowing that we'll get to one or two more games as the process goes on for final evaluations. You watch Turner last year and you see a player who is just a true sophomore. So this totally makes sense. Starting for the first time, his pass rush profile was based off of first step explosiveness. So his athleticism and his long arm, he's got a great long arm move. And that was, that was what he, that was basically his entire pass rush plan last year. He didn't really have a lot of good counters. Didn't really know what to do with his hands when it came to like hand swipes, club rips, things like that. Just didn't have that in the arsenal. So you could see the athletic potential from him. But this year, he packed on like 10 pounds. Now Alabama's got him listed at 257. And you see it. You physically see it. it. I I actually believe it. And now the long arm isn't the only pass rush move that he has. It's just where he starts. Now it's a building block for everything else where he'll hit you with a long arm. He'll hit you with a bull rush. But then he'll hit you with a spin move. He'll hit you with a cross chop. He'll get around the shoulder. He'll give you a nice because he's got the bend. I think he's probably got the best bend in the class. He's got the ability to hit you with a ghost rush, give you a little dip and dip and rip right outside the outside shoulder. Like the, I, I just the the progress you mentioned it. This is the version of Dallas Turner that we've been waiting for. The progress that he has made. You talk about a guy whose arrow is pointing up, as so encouraging for what I think he is going to become as a pro. So all, the athletic ability now that he's gotten more weight, the strength. Um, the length advantage that he has, the flexibility, the first the first step explosiveness, the fact that the pass rush moves just continue to grow. That's why I got him as edge one. I, I like Dallas Turner a lot. Yeah, I get it. I mean, with these guys so close, I'll highlight just what makes them so great. I think you nailed it with Turner. He's a premium athlete. I, he, I would, wherever he goes, I just hope that a defense is like, okay, we're going to have you stand up over guards and centers. We are going to have you uh, disguise and really mug up at the line of scrimmage and drop back and move around in zone coverage. We're going to have you on third and longs rush from a very wide alignment and get that runway and use your speed. Like, like he is, there's a lot to fall in love with there. Now, verse. I just see heavyweight hands. Like these are the kinds of hands that Bro, tra- heavyweight champ, call right? Him, call, call him what he needs to in this class, dude. He's the, he's the heavyweight champ in this, in this class. He is when his hands land, there's a jilt that hits tackles mm-hmm. and it, it shakes him up. And I think verse why it's so important. How good his hands are. He gets off the ball. So when you're getting off the ball and dictating the rep and you have good hand placement and power in your hands, there's not really much a tackle can do to counter that. Now, yes, NFL tackles will be stronger, so they'll be able to handle it better than college tackles, but he's still dictating reps, and he can run through you. He can relocate you. He can win that outside shoulder. I think when the bright lights are the brightest in the second half versus has some of his best moments throughout his college mm-hmm. career, he's a guy that's already shown the work ethic to get insanely stronger and bigger. If you know his story from Albany and the pandemic to Florida state and all these things. Uh, I I actually think to be honest with you of the three Latu verse and Turner, I think verse has the highest floor of the three. I really do. I think he's the most stalwart run defender in terms of just purely setting the edge. Mm -hmm. And I think his power profile combined with his athleticism translates as a rusher, but I can talk myself into 
the athleticism and upside of Turner being the best. And then Latu's just been the most productive, right? Like with the most vast moves package. Yeah. That's what you fall in love with Latu. Now he needs to meet athletic thresholds at the combine. He does. For, and, and if he doesn't, like it's it's really good. You're between the medical retirement and and mediocre to poor testing, like that's second round kind of drop. Right. But the, the tape is first, the tape is top 12 tape. I no, I, I agree with and you. And that's where we are right now, Trevor. We this is the tape process. Yeah, like we, we didn't get Correct. the testing. We didn't get the medical you know, rumors. And, like this is the tape process and Latu passes that test with flying colors. Oh, my goodness. So Latu, just some some numbers from PFF data. Again, this is cumulative over the last two years. Pass rush grade, 94.5. Insane. Pass rush grade on true pass sets, 94.9. Still insane. Pass rush win percentage, 22.3%. That's the 99th percentile of not just college players, but like recent NFL pros as well. The way that we that that uh, Steve Palazzolo actually kind of built the percentile system, it compares guys that have had a decent amount of snaps in the league already over the last couple of years. Like you are also comparing, like he's comparing those guys, him to those players. So it's not just like, oh, we're comparing them to guys that are never going to succeed in the league. No, no, no. He's comparing it to guys who have already kind of shown that they're going to be around the league a little bit. 99th percentile, it's insane. Run defense grade, still pretty high, 78.4%. Wins above replacement average this year was a 0.51. That's nuts for an edge rusher. That is insanely high. Half a win? He's worth half a win above average as an edge rusher? I don't happen very often. I mean, that's higher than Verse. That's higher than um, Dallas Turner. Dallas Verse had a uh, where was he? Turner had a point two seven. Verse had a point two nine. Uh, Trice actually had that point four zero, which is pretty damn good. Um, and then what was Chops? Chops is pretty high too, I think. Where's Robinson? Come on, point three five. Okay, so not not as high as, as Trice was, but anyways, he's sick. I mean, the production level that he had w- was insane, and I agree with you completely. He needs to test well, and like I jokingly slash not jokingly said, if he t- if he if he hits thresholds, I'll put him back at edge one. I just watched the tape a little bit, and I was like, all right, kind of see it here. I kind of see where you go when the competition level gets better, when we get against NFL level guys. Does he have that natural strength and athletic ability to continue to win the way that his technique would say? When it comes to Jared Verse, I agree with you completely, man. This is the last line of my uh, scouting report for Verse. This is a player who brings his hard hat and his lunch pail every Hell single time. Yeah. Wins with strength on a regular basis and is built like a first-round pro. And I think that that's the case uh, over the last... It was a little bit of a slow burn this year, and I think that people maybe... Well, I think our, our, my, myself included, like I had Verse a little bit further down on the big board as the season went on just because he started off decently slow, but he ended the year really strong. Um, especially against Louisville, reminded us who he was and why he was a first-round prospect. He is also somebody who just he loves the hard work of the game, right? I mean, I think that his literal body is a example of that. How he was able to gain forty pounds in one in in one off season when the COVID season was canceled and he was still at Albany, became transformed into a completely different player because of that. But I've also gotten the chance to talk with him before. He's told me he's a huge Max Crosby guy, loves watching Max Crosby films, so he's constantly trying to do that and get better. He was on the Feldman's freak list. Um, he's, I mean, th- this is somebody who we, we've talked about on this podcast. If Jared Verse would have been in last year's class, I think he goes number eight overall to the Las Vegas Raiders. The, Fal- the Falcons are eight. Oh, Raiders, Raiders, Raiders seven? 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 Yep, Something like that. Tyree. Whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. He he's going at that spot to the Raiders. The top 15 is still realistic for him, even in a better class. I still think that it's realistic for him. So those are, uh, yeah, those are our top three edge rushers. Um, did I, uh, I didn't, I don't want to cut you off if you had any more info or anything else you want to say on Turner verse or Latu. No, that was perfect. I, I think we've talked a lot about these guys and I'll say this, like it's a big credit to them that they all had, they all had really good years, right? Like that's no given coming off so much expectations. And I think all of them were wildly impressive this year after being wildly impressive last year. I agree. This is a good edge rush class, man. This is a fun edge rush class. It is. 
there's there's some guys that it might not have like the number one overall prospect like a Nick Bosa or Miles Garrett or, or something like that, but there are it's a lot of different shapes and sizes for these players. A lot of guys who have won in a lot of different ways, and it's going to be a fun off season process, not just for like Shrine Bowl, Senior Bowl, but like you mentioned, combines going to be so big when it comes to final placements of where we believe these edge rushers are going to be ranked against each other or they're going to be ranked against the rest of the class. We would love to hear you guys' thoughts as well. Uh, give us your takes on our takes. Uh, I wonder if people out there have some strong Chop Robinson takes, whether it's uh, against Connors or against mine for being a little bit lower. Tell us what you think about a lot of these edge rushers, not just Chop Robinson, the guys have, that we've talked about, their strengths and weaknesses, everything. What you think about the class overall, we would love to hear from you. Best way to do that. Uh, and if or youtube.com backslash NFL stock exchange, if you are audio only at Tampa Bay Trey at Connor J Rogers on X and Instagram, it's a great way to get on the show. I have noticed that we are starting to get a lot more into draft season. Cause I get to see a lot of you guys respond to us and tweet at us and things like that. And that is something that's really, really cool. So keep doing that. We absolutely love it. We've loved all the responses from the mock draft episode, the wide receiver episode, let us know what position you want to see next because we're, we're flexible here. We got a little bit of time. I think we're probably only going to give you one episode next week. It's probably going to be a fixture franchise for the holidays because Christmas comes on a Monday. So normally we get a Monday episode out, but I know bummer. We got to hang out with our family. Oh, man. What a drag. I was using that as an excuse. What are you doing? <laughs> but I do think we're going to give you at least a fixture franchise episode next week. So let us know which fixture franchise you want to see and then which position group you want to have us update next as well connor you got anything else before we get out of here no man fun show we love this position group uh a lot of talent as we said if you want to see how they all fall into place for me uh, i know trevor your big board pff.com it's right there on the draft section for me nbcsports.com if you go to the college football page it's it's right there if you just search my name and big board i have a top 75 that just launched this week so uh, you can see how these guys all fall into place with the rest of the position groups. Also, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna shout you out here. The uh, please the don't. Mets the Mets podcast getting nominated. Thank in, you in two different categories for what, what, what a sports podcast of the year award, my friend. You wear so many hats. You, co <laughs> you cover the Jets. You cover the Mets. You cover the NFL draft. And uh, honestly, any podcast that you're on deserves to get nominated. And I don't say that selfishly because I'm one of them on one of them with <laughs> you. But you are good enough to wear whatever podcast you are on deserves to be up for or uh, should be up for an award. And you got two for the Mets podcast, and uh, that's awesome, man. I wanted to say that I see on the show. You are too good of a friend, even though you refuse to text me when we're watching these positions getting ready for the show because we don't <laughs> want to ruin the content. You are too good of a friend, and who knows, maybe the sex addicts army and the nfl stock exchange will be up for a fancy award can you imagine us doing a speech holding the trophy <laughs> well <laughs> we're just as surprised as all of you <laughs> we would have i i would hope that it'd be like the most casual award ceremony ever but you and i would just rent tuxedos for it uh, you know I, there's no other way to do it yeah we ask 100 yeah. if it's near water we'll take a boat to the ceremony <laughs> They're like just outlandish, outlandish. Even if it's not near water, it we're going to drive a boat that's like on a like Tried motorized trailer. trailer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. Yes, 100%. Just absolutely James Bonded up. But uh, again, I love it. congrats, my friend. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody out there. Everyone. This is the last time that we get to, that we'll talk to you before the holidays. So Merry Christmas, happy holidays. We hope that everybody out there has a fun, safe, and wonderful holidays. Whatever you are doing, whether it's spending time with family, friends, just eating good food, enjoying some football, whatever. We love you guys so much for listening to this show. Um, we really would not be in this spot without you guys. We appreciate it. And we'll talk to you before the new year. So we'll give you New Year's wishes at some point on next show. But... Until next time, which is probably going to be Wednesday, just letting you guys know. I'm Trevor Sikama. That is Connor Rogers. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. We'll see you next week.